Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, again, we're going to post this so other people will be able to see it as well. But this is this is a big deal uh, to us in the city. Obviously, uh, in Central Texas, Oakville can uh, devastate a community, and in our community, a lot of us know that. Uh, frankly, the oaks are part of the value of, of our homes. It's the value of our community, the value of our homes. And uh, interestingly enough, and he probably, I've heard him speak before, he'll probably talk a little bit about diversity. And I'm not sure we did a really good job years ago in the, in the city with diversity of, of, uh, of our trees. And because of that, a lot of us have almost nothing but oak. Uh, but nevertheless, we, uh, we need to spread the word, we need to address this. <coughs> Uh, we can help our neighbors when they when they maybe don't understand the prevention and mitigation and those kinds of things. So, so everybody that's here uh, now becomes kind of an ambassador for taking care of our community local. So, uh, so sincerely, I, I appreciate that. So, I want to introduce Mr. Evanson. Robert Evanson, biologist for certified arborist, Texas uh, A&M Forest Service, 20 plus years in uh, in state service. Uh, and, and frankly, for all things Oakville, he's the man. Uh, and, uh, and and also, and I won't, I, I, I have to say, he's not just an Oakville guy. Uh, you know, conservation uh, and land stewardship and, and a lot of other things that you would expect from a guy that's a, a, a biologist uh, and certified arborist. Um, recently, he uh, was even acknowledged by Texas Forest Service uh, Director's Award. Uh, in 2018, yeah. I don't know if I was say that, but I'd say that because they they acknowledge his his organization acknowledges that he's valued he's valuable to them as well as to us. Uh, he's worked and, and, and now close to home here. He's worked with us since uh, 2013 on everything we've dealt with with Oakville, including we've had Oakville in our city, uh, and. You know, some of us, who is at Oak Wilt? And I, I always go to, to Stephen, uh, Mr. Simons, our, our uh, public works director, and say, hey, what do you think? And the first thing he does is send it off to Robert and say, what do you think? And uh, I will tell you, it's a good feeling to know that we have somebody that can tell us pretty much definitive, definitively whether it is or it isn't. And uh, for that, I, I can't thank him enough. And I can't thank him enough for the relationship we've had with him because uh, the response and responsiveness that we get from Mr. Edmondson uh, is is uh, what I wish I, we got from everybody else as an external organization. Uh, so he really does a lot for the, the central central Texas, but for us personally in uh, in Garden Ridge. Uh, and uh, I just want to thank him also for coming in here today. Some of you may have heard him before. This isn't the first time he's willing to come in here and. Uh, and spread the good word uh, as much as as much as much uh, we can bring him in here, and, and he's come in at least once a year, and I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate that he also agreed that we could get this recorded and post it so we can reach even more people. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome, to welcome uh, Mr. Robert Hibbs. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, boy. Now, just set me up for failure, right? That's how this always works. Um, anyway, like I said, do I need to lower this down a little bit? Like I said, I, I talk loud. Um, how many of y'all have heard this one before? Have y'all sat through one of these? A couple of you have. All right, y'all can leave because it's the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's the same thing over and over. Uh, but anyway, what we're going to do today or this evening, we're going to talk a little bit about oak wilt. Uh, first, we're going to talk about uh, kind of a little bit about the biology of it and, and how, it, how it works. And then based on that, we'll talk about the uh, management uh, recommendations and, and how to deal with it. So without further ado, if the mouse will work and the mouse is not working, there it is. Uh, literally, and I'm using the word literally correctly here, literally thousands of acres of uh, Texas, Central and West Texas have been, been impacted by this disease. Uh, and it's not just a rural issue. It does affect urban and suburban areas. Um, obviously, we've had three different oak wilt centers here in the, in the city of Garden Ridge. Um, it's just, it's, it knows no bounds, let's put it that way. Um, I always crack up at that bottom slide. Uh, that was taken by one of my bosses many, many, many years ago. He's a shadeless tree mechanic. He can't even provide his own shade. 
uh, because the trees did. And in the upper right, that is actually, that's how they were used to treat trees way back in the day before we kind of had a handle on how, what oak wilt was and how it operated. Uh, those are, and, and they considered that a success. Those were successful treatments back in the day. So yeah, we've come a long way since then. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the critter that causes oak wilt. Oak wilt is, is it's a living organism. It's caused by a fungus, or the disease is caused by a fungus. Uh, it's called Brettziella fagaciarum. It formerly was called Ceratocystis fagaciarum. We just recently, or the name has just recently changed. So a lot of the literature you'll read, it'll still say Ceratocystis. It still means the same thing. Uh, what this thing is, it is a... It is a, what we call a primary vascular pathogen. And I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes on this. Primary means that the health or stress level of the tree has no bearing on whether that tree can be infected by this fungus or not. In other words, you can fertilize and water your trees until the cows come home and they can still get infected by oak wilt. All right? And this is going to be important when we start talking about treatments a little further along. It is vascular. This fungus lives in the water conducting vessels of oak trees, period. The only place this fungus can live is inside the water conducting vessels of oaks, what we call the xylem. And it is a pathogen. It does eventually cause the demise of the tree, okay? Uh, it relies on insects for overland transportation. We're going to talk about that ad nauseum here in just a few minutes. Uh, fungal mats, again, we'll talk about that. The fungus itself is heat sensitive. If you can heat it above 95 degrees, you can kill it. And so y'all are probably looking at me going, well, it's 100 degrees out there right now. <laughs> but again, the fungus lives in the water conducting vessels. It's under the bark, it's in the stem, and it's also down in the root system, okay, under the ground. So it doesn't get 95 degrees down there. That's why the fungus... When they first discovered oak wilt way back in the day, um, they said, ah, it's too hot in Texas. It'll never be a problem in Texas. You don't have to worry about it. And we've probably got the worst oak wilt in the country. Okay, so anyway, that shows how much scientists know, right? Uh, and we don't know where it came from. We do know it is only found in the US. It's, it's not found in any other country. It's not, it's not like Dutch elm disease or gypsy moth or anything like that that was brought over from a different country. It is native, it is ours. Uh, the theory is that oak wilt has probably been in Texas since oak trees have been in Texas. It's just always, always been here. Uh, it's not, and again, it's not just a Texas problem. It's in, I think, 26 different states now. That's kind of an old map. It was first discovered up there in central Wisconsin, way back in 1941. And the, one of the gentlemen working on the disease, his name was Brett's. Hence, Brett Ziella Figaciarum. They changed the name in his honor. Um, it's not that it started up there and then spread. It's back when it was discovered. Think about the communications in, in the 40s. Not great, right? So what would happen is, is they'd have foresters meetings. Oh, we found this new disease. And so the adjacent states, they would send representatives and they'd learn about it. And then they'd come to their state. And, oh, geez, we have it too. And then they'd hold a conference. And that's kind of how the word got spread. It's not that the disease was spread. It was probably always there in those places. In Texas, uh, we, weren't, we had our first um, confirmed diagnosis in 1964, I think it was, in Dallas County of all places. So it's, it's been around a while. Uh, in Texas, 76 central and west Texas counties, uh, the disease is present in those counties. Um, I want you all to kind of take a mental picture of this map, the one with the red, and we're going to talk about how it got out in those western counties in the panhandle. The other map, the one on the right, is an, an intensity map. The darker the county, the more incidence of oak wilt in that county. Um, my region can, uh, covers seven different counties, and I can tell you by far that Gillespie County is the worst one in my region. Comal is actually not that bad yet, and we want to keep it that way. Um, unfortunately, it seems like a new Oak Wilt Center pops up about every year in Comal County, but I can pretty much count on my hands and toes the number of Oak Wilt Centers in the entirety of Comal County. There's probably 1,500, maybe 2,000 in Gillespie County. So it's a huge difference. It's a big difference. 
All right, we're going to dispel a lot of myths. One myth is that some oaks don't get oak wilt, and that's technically not true. All right, all oaks can get the disease. If you look at the, at the genus Quercus oaks, there's probably about 500 species worldwide. It is a huge group, okay? And they, you can divide that into about six or seven different categories. And we're only gonna be concerned really with two categories here in Central Texas, red oaks and white oaks. We have many, many species of red oak, and we have many, many species of white oak. And the disease and the tree's response are different for the different types of oaks. Red oaks, which are Spanish oak and the blackjack oak and the Schumard oak. Those are the three red oaks we have here in Central Texas. They get oak wilt, they die. 100% mortality, and they can play a unique role in the way the disease is spread over land. Again, we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. White oaks are kinda on the other end of the spectrum. White oaks will include post oak, bur oak, chinkapin oak, lacy oak, white shin oak, Monterey oak, and if you go out west, there's pungent oak, sandpaper oak, vasey oak, there's a bunch of them. They, they tend to tolerate the disease much better. 26 years with the Forest Service, out dealing with oak wilt, day after day after day, I've seen two post oaks that I suspected died from oak wilt, two. All right. Now, if you look at a post oak cross side, that sucker will kill over and die on you. Or if you build next to it, or if you turn the water off or over water, it, it'll die. But it's not oak wilt that's killing it. It's all these other things. But as far as oak wilt goes, they're pretty resilient. Um, live oak is technically a white oak, but it actually kind of falls in the middle. It shares characteristics of both red and white oaks. The reason oak wilt is so devastating to live oaks, twofold. Number one, what are most of the trees we have in Central Texas other than juniper? Live oak. Live oak. Number two, they grow in interconnected root systems. So once one tree gets the disease, all of them are going to get the disease. Making a little bit of sense here? Okay. And feel free, if you have any questions or anything, shoot your hand up or yell it out or whatever. I'll, I'll be more than happy to stop in the middle. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to make the point that there are no oak trees that are immune to the disease, even the white oaks, even Monterey oak. Now, would that uh, hamper me from planting them? No. I don't have an issue planting them. I wouldn't plant them directly back into an, a, an active oak wilt center, but as far as introducing them into your yard, absolutely. I have no issues with that at all. Okay, matter of fact, I plant them in my yard every year. I make it a point to plant one or two trees in my yard every year. I live on one acre. I'm gonna have the world's smallest arboretum. It's, I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, generally not. Uh, the question was, can the different oak species root graft with each other? Sometimes yes, most of the time no. No, no, uh, no, white oaks, and they can. Uh, live oak are the most massively root connected. Of the white oaks, we have, there's a couple of species called shin oak, white shin oak, and then there's another species called lacy oak. They tend to root connect with each other, not near as severely as live oaks. Uh, Spanish oak, I've seen them kind of root connect to each other. But like if a blackjack oak and a post oak are standing right next to each other, are they root connected? Probably not. Now, I learned a long, long time ago when we talk about mother nature and, and everything, you never say never and you never say always because you will be proven wrong. Okay, oh, I already switched the slide. Um, let's talk about the overland spread of the disease. This is a little complicated. It's not super complicated, but it's, and it's going to sound like science fiction, but this truly happens. First and foremost, oak wilt, or the, disease, the fungus that causes oak wilt, is a living organism. It's a fungus. Fungi reproduce by forming spores. Okay, so every fungi, whether it be bread mold, the mushrooms you buy at the grocery store, oak wilt, they all reproduce by forming spores. The way oak wilt does this, is they form on a specialized structure called a fungal mat. Now, a few things about this fungal mat. 
Number one, they only form on red oaks that have contracted oak wilt. So this only occurs on Spanish oak, blackjack oak, or Schumard oaks that have contracted the disease. Live oaks do not form fungal mats or any of the white oaks, okay? Number two, these fungal mats have a very fruity odor associated with them. They smell like rotten peaches, rotten melons, just a very sickeningly sweet smell. They form under the bark against the wood. So you'll never see one. And the oak wilt spores are extremely sticky, which is, is pretty important here. All right, there are a group of beetles or a group of insects. Well, let me back up. Because, yes, sir? It occurred to me earlier, what you just said uh, brought it back to my uh, thinking. Do you have dogs that can smell this out? Do we have dogs? I can smell them out. Anybody can smell them out. Okay. Yeah, you can. You can. Let me get there. I, I know where you're going, but let me, let me get there. Okay. Uh, like I said, first and foremost, you have to have the red oak contract the disease, and then it has to contract it at the right time of the year. And it, not every red oak that contracts oak wilt forms fungal mats. It's actually a very, very small percentage that do this, and it has to do with temperature and season and moisture and all of that kind of stuff. All right. So anyway... So if a fungus has a fruity odor and sticky spores, what do you think carries those spores around? Insects, right? It's, it's, it's evolved. I must have reached back and turned it off. I'm sorry. I hate these things. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I must. I'm, I bet I accidentally pushed the button. Uh, accidentally on purpose. No, I'm kidding. Uh, anyway, sap beetles. Let's go back to these sap beetles. Um, sap beetles really like to eat fungal mats. They're really attracted to that odor, and they really. Test, 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 okay. Okay, so, uh, sap beetles, sap beetles, thank you. I lost my train of thought. I was going back to, I was thinking about karaoke two weeks ago. No, <laughs> okay, yeah, sap beetles. Okay, so these sap beetles, they're just opportunistic feeders. They like to eat sweet things. So if you run over the cactus out in the pasture, sap beetles will be on it. Y'all have all seen a sap beetle, you just didn't know it. And I know some of you, if you sit out on the back deck, maybe have a glass of wine, maybe a cold beer, maybe eating a piece of fruit, and you've got that one really persistent gnat that's really working you over, that was probably a sap beetle. That's how attracted they are to this stuff. The other thing about these sap beetles are they're tiny. You see those two dots underneath that dime? Those are life-size sap beetles. Don't call me when you see the black and white beetle that's about this big crawling up the trunk of your tree. That is not a sap beetle. These sap beetles are like the size of a freckle on your arm, okay? These are teeny tiny little guys. The issue is, is if a sap beetle flies into fungal mat and feeds on the fungal mat, it picks up those sticky spores on its body. And then if it visits a wound on an oak tree, the spore gets deposited on that cut surface and then the spore germinates Fungus colonizes the tree. Houston, we have a problem, okay? Now, just looking at that slide right there, you can figure out how to prevent oak wilt. And it's not kill the beetles. It's the wounding. What is the one thing in that equation that we have control over? 
the wounding. That's the only thing we have control over. Okay, so we're going to talk a bit again about that. Now, if that... Technology. I remember I was out, I'd had a notepad and a pencil and a map, a paper map. Okay, golly. All right, so anyway, uh, if a live oak is infected, live oaks are all root connected to each other. And I cannot stress how root connected live oaks are. I almost, if there weren't rivers in the way, I would say you could probably follow a root connection from Austin all the way out to Ozona. I, I really think you could. That's how root connected these things are. Um, the other thing, um, we were all taught wrong about trees in school. Every single one of us in this room, except maybe with the exception of her, uh, were taught incorrectly about trees. Um, we all saw that picture, the mirror image. This is the above ground portion and this is the root system. That's wrong. Wrong, 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 wrong. The best way to envision a, a tree is think of a wine glass sitting on a dinner plate. The dinner plate is the root system. It's much wider than the drip line or the canopy of the, of the oak, and it's very shallow. That's how all trees grow. Some trees have tap roots, some don't, but the, the roots really extend well beyond the canopy. Well, with live oak, they have what they do. They don't have tap roots. They send out these long, what we call laterals, and then they send sinkers down, and that's kind of what holds them in the ground. Okay, so they're basically grabbing to the, to the ground, and that's how they're... But then they send root sprouts up off of those. Okay, and then other ones come in, and then they... And, and so you have this massive interconnected system. Basically, uh, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is y'all look in your yard and you go, oh, I've got that oak tree and that oak tree and that live oak and this one. No, you have one tree that's under the ground that's just got a bunch of branches sticking up. That's how you have to envision these live oaks, okay? So once the disease gets in those live oaks or, and it starts moving through that root system, it'll progress at an annual rate of about 50 to 75 feet a year. So it's just kind of a slow burn. It just slowly marches across the pasture. All right? Okay, and everything I've just told you up to this point is depicted on this slide. We're not going to worry about this slide because I've already covered all of this. The main thing I want to point out is that the red oak, there's two different phases. There's a red oak phase and a live oak phase. The red oak phase, we have the potential for forming fungal mats and starting new oak wilt centers. The live oak phase is actually a dead end. The problem is, is the dead end is ozona until we run out of live oaks, okay? That's, that's where the issues come in here. All right, uh, diagnosis, I'm not going to go into, I don't have my pointer, so I can't really help you out on this. Basically, red oaks, can y'all see that kind of red looking tree down in the corner? Um, the best way to think about, it all starts with the red oaks. Okay, so we have a red oak, it gets a fungal mat, and then beetles come and visit this, and then they pick up spores, and then they fly out of that mat, and they go and start new oak wilt centers. So I put a fire analogy to this. This is the fire, and those beetles carrying those spores are the embers, and they're flying out, starting new fires, okay? I am saying fire, right? I have, a, I have East Texas accent, I, for, winter, but anyway. Uh, so beetle lands in an oak tree, in a live oak, and starts the disease. Now it spreads through the root system. So that disease center, the live oak center over there, that's probably about a four or five year old center, oak wilt center, because it started in the middle and then progressively spread from tree to tree year after year after year. All right? Okay, now I'm kind of going to go back and forth between live oak, well, no, I think I've corrected that. Um, live oaks. You're basically, when a live oak gets the disease, more times than not, it will rapidly defoliate. It can be dead in three to six months, so it's pretty quick. Uh, it will spread to its neighbors through the root connections. Uh, they do not form fungal mats, 
and a small percentage of the live oak population will survive the disease. Anywhere from five to um, maybe even up towards 20%. Now, survive just means the tree is still alive. You may lose 95% of the canopy, but if it's got a few green leaves on it, a couple of years later, technically that's considered a survivor. There's no way to predict which trees will survive and which trees will die. So just forget that. <laughs> just, just get it out. All right, that is the same tree. All three of those pictures, that's the same tree. Yeah, yeah, down in Bandera County. One of the telltale symptoms for oak wilt is this particular leaf symptom. We call it venal chlorosis or venal necrosis. It means either yellow veins or dead veins. Kind of has a fish skeleton appearance to it, sort of, kind of, if you use your imagination. Um, that's pretty diagnostic of oak wilt, but not exclusive. Um, lightning strike can form this. Excessive heat, excessive drought, um, salt, excessive fertilizer, excessive salt. Uh, we got a call from Florida one year. Turned out it was a lightning strike, but it had perfect venal necrosis. One of our oak wilt vendors, we got a call from him. Man, I can't believe I got oak. I gave myself oak wilt. We go out to his place, and the one branch that was hanging over his barbecue pit were exhibiting symptoms. It was the heat coming off of his barbecue pit that was causing that. So it's, you've got to take, in other words, what I'm trying to say is don't just pick up a leaf off of the ground that looks like this and automatically jump to the conclusion that it's oak wilt. Yes, sir? So those are sap beetles. Sap beetles. Do they have a height limit? I mean, so the, height the reason limit. I'm asking this question is because we had these windstorms a couple of months ago. I've heard about so the windstorms, yeah. They, they fly. They fly. They fly. These little, those teeny tiny little sap beetles fly, and they on their own can probably go a half a mile. Okay. Just on their own. Yeah, because we, we've got a bunch of yeah. blooms okay. that have busted. I understand. And I, I'm not going to climb up there and... Well, it's too late now. It's too late. It's way too late now. We're going to talk about that. I promise you. Let me get there. Let me get there. Okay. I promise we're going to talk about that. So anyway, so one of the foliar symptoms is venal chlorosis or necrosis. Uh, we also get a leaf symptom that's exactly the opposite. We call it vein banding, where the veins stay green and the rest of the leaf kind of fades out. Yes? Uh, I mentioned when I in introduced Robert that um, we go to him when we think we have and the last picture, we've had uh, lightning strike trees and some other trees where Stephen and I look at it and go, oh man, this looks like oak wilt. And when he gets it, he goes, no, it was a lightning strike. And, and, but in fact, we just had one just a few months ago that yep. really, it was dying, it had those kind of, it, I mean, it really looked it liked, like the, exactly like those, uh, those leaves that you see. Yeah. So it does happen around so, here. Yeah. But that doesn't mean, don't, assume it's not. And don't and don't base all of your info on, on I've I've misdiagnosed it myself. Diagnosing the disease is pretty difficult. It can be difficult. It can be extremely <laughs> difficult. But here's another foliar symptom that it could be oak wilt. It could be something else. Uh, we have another foliar symptom where you get just tip burn, marginal necrosis. Uh, so it, so it can manifest its way in in in, a, in several different ways in live oak through foliar symptoms. In red oaks. Oh, and one other symptom is sometimes you'll have a tree that'll just brown out. It just turns brown. Uh, not often, but, but occasionally. Red oaks are a little different. Red oaks, they tend to turn red, or what we call bronzing, at, or flagging at the wrong time of the year. The whole tree dies, it dies pretty rapidly, and they tend to hold on to their leaves for a little while, and then they'll drop them. Uh, so basically, if you have a tree that looks like it should be November, but it looks like that in March, something's wrong, okay? Um, the other thing is they die very rapidly, four to six weeks. I have seen a full-grown, beautiful red oak go in three weeks' time, just from healthy to stone-cold dead that quick. Uh, it could possibly spread to adjacent trees through, through root connections. Um, it could possibly form fungal mats and no survivors. If a red oak gets oak wilt, it's done. Now, there is another disease out here that is very prevalent this time of year. It's called bacterial leaf scorch, or BLS. Um, 
with BLS, what happens, the tree will start looking like it's starting to die, and it'll do kind of like that one on the right. It'll get kind of go through the can, and then it'll just stop. And it won't progress and completely die. That's not oak wilt. If the tree, if the red oak did not completely die within that one season, it's not oak wilt. Okay. Those are the foliar symptoms for oak wilt and red oak. Boy, that's diagnostic, isn't it? If you gave me that leaf and asked, I'd never mind. I would probably curse under my breath and do something. Now, let's talk about fungal mats. Again, fungal mats only form on red oaks that have contracted oak wilt. You have to have certain conditions. Basically, for a fungal mat to form on a red oak, the red oak is not completely dead. It still has a green cambium, cambial layer because these fungal mats form right on top of the cambium. So it's basically trees that are red oaks that contract oak wilt late fall, early winter are the ones most likely to form fungal mats the following spring. Here in Texas, fungal mats are formed in the spring. You go up north and they have a spring season and a fall season. Luckily, we just have a spring season down here. It gets so stinking hot in the summertime that the trees dry out and there's no way we're gonna have fungal mats in the fall. Uh, you can have multiple fungal mats per tree. That's what's depicted in the lower picture. Um, what you actually see out in the wild is the upper left picture. It's just a crack in the bark. But you can smell it. Once you get that smell, it's just one of those things that, that it's ingrained in me. I can just smell it. Um, again, cool, moist weather in the spring. That's when fungal mats produced. And I just covered all of that, didn't I? Okay. Um, so... Keep that in mind, fungal mats produced in the spring. If all else fails and we can't come to a diagnosis or come to a conclusion based on, on all of the above, <coughs> pardon me, uh, we can take samples. Um, we want to get down into the, into the xylem, into the first two or three growth rings, not too deep into the tree. Um, and if the fungus is present in that sample of wood, and if we don't get it hot or wet or contaminate it or freeze it or all kinds of other things, and we get it to the lab, and if they get it at the lab and they make, take a subsample of that, if the fungus is in that, they can grow it in a Petri dish. So if you get a positive back for oak wilt or for Brettziella fagaciarum, you have oak wilt. If you get a negative back, you may or may not have oak wilt. Again, we're just taking a sample, all right? And there's a lot. And when it's hot, there is no point in doing this because the fungus isn't in the stem or in the branches. It's down in the root system. You, if I went out to sample a tree today, it would come back negative. No doubt about it because it's just too hot and dry. The fungus isn't in the tree. Uh, there's do's and don'ts. I'm not going to go through that. Everybody get your phones out and take a picture. Um, plantclinic.tamu.edu. This is the, uh, the te Texas Disease Plant Di Disease Diagnostic Lab, easy for me to say. Um, and they don't do just oak wilt. I mean, they, you've got plant problems or issues or things like that. Take pictures, take samples, send them in. There's, just go to the website. There's instructions how to download the form, the whole nine yards. Uh, an oak wilt sample will run you, I think it's 40 bucks now. Most samples will run you somewhere between 35 and 40 bucks. There's some specialized things that are a little more expensive. But uh, I'm on, I've got these funny looking yellow spots with uh, yellow circles with black spots on my tomato leaves. Send it to the Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab. Okay? That's what they're here for. And they're good. And Sheila McBride, she runs the lab. If you're not, well, I almost said something bad. If you're polite and courteous, she will go out of her way to help you, but if you're kind of jerkish, uh, be prepared. <laughs> okay. All right, now then we've gotten to the point where we can talk about managing this disease. You have to understand the biology of the fungus, the biology of the tree, and how they interact with each other before we can even start talking about managing this thing. Now, one thing I want to be crystal clear, 
There is no cure for oak wilt. There never will be a cure for oak wilt. It's never going to happen. I would give you the details, but we'd be here for another hour and a half. Basically, red oaks and live oaks don't have the genetic ability to recognize the oak wilt fungus when it's coming into the tree. That's what it boils down to. It's as simple as that. We're not going to change the genetics of the tree to make them be able to recognize the oak wilt fungus. On its own. In some places, it just stops. Sometimes it just does that. It either runs out of host or... Um, I, I've seen exactly what you're talking about. I have no explanation. I, I honestly, I, I just don't have, I don't have any explanation for that. But I've seen some areas where it appeared to have stopped, and then three or four or five years later down the road, then it flares back up. So it doesn't truly stop. As long as it's got host, it has the potential to spread. I just lied to you. There is a cure for oak wilt. Take all of the oaks out of your landscape. That's the only way you're not going to have oak wilt. Okay, but we basically use a four-pronged approach in this order when dealing with oak wilt. Prevention, planting other trees, then trenching, and then fungicide injections. We're going to talk about it. Uh, I don't need to do that. Let's do this. Prevention. Don't get it. Right? Don't get it. Sap beetles are active in the spring. Fungal mats are produced in the spring. What should we not be doing in the spring? Trimming our trees. So if you'll look at all the handouts and our recommendations and everything, we recommend not pruning oak trees from February through June. Right? Can we leave the saws in the tool shed for five months? Okay? Secondly, always immediately paint the pruning or the wound, not just necessarily a pruning cut, but the wound on oak trees. Immediately cut, paint. Down to what size? That big. Yeah, but tree trimmers never do. That. I know they don't. Never. I know they don't. We recommend anything that's bigger then the diameter of your pinky should be painted. All right. I know they don't. I know they don't. Uh, sometimes I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about this painting for a little bit. I'm going to answer your questions before you ask them, except for this one. Question number one. What type of paint? Any type of paint. The purpose of the paint is to keep the sap feeding beetle from, I'm going to use the word smelling the sap coming out of the wound and potentially coming to your tree. That's the whole purpose of the paint. You can do the high dollar tree coat pruning paint stuff if you want. I hate that <coughs> stuff. It gets on your glasses, it gets on your clothes, it doesn't wash off. Even if you clear the nozzle every time you use it, the nozzle clogs up and you throw half a can of paint away and it's about, I don't know what it is now, five or six bucks a can, it's expensive. I go bottom shelf, cheapest stuff I can find. Uh, I like a medium gray color because it matches the bark. No, in, in all seriousness, that's what I like. Now if you come to my house right now, you're going to see red and gold and blue because that's all I had at the house. I pruned some trees a few days ago and that's all I had. Um, but the key is getting the paint on immediately. Can you brush it on? Absolutely. Can you use water-based paint? Absolutely. Does it have to be fungicide amended paint? No, it doesn't. Just paint. That wound on that tree is attractive to sap beetles for anywhere from 48 to 72 hours. After a couple of three days, the tree has already closed that wound. Sap is no longer coming to the surface. It's no longer attracted to the beetle. All right? I didn't say you had two to three days to paint the wound. That's not what I said. If you haven't painted it within those two or three days, don't bother painting it. It's too late. Okay? Should I paint dead branches that I prune out of my tree? How many of you in here are a certified arborist? Paint dead branches that you cut out of your trees. 
in, of dead branches. And the reason I say that, I know how to make a proper pruning cut where I'm not going to get down into the living material. But if you get too close, you're going to cut into the living material where the sap could be coming out. That's attracted to the beetles. So if I'm Joe Blow landowner, tree guy, or tree owner out there, I'm painting it. Do I have to paint things other than oaks? No. Only oaks get oak wilt. Only paint oaks. Please do not paint your crepe myrtles or your cedar elms or your pecans. It's totally unnecessary. The only reason, again, the only reason we're painting is to keep the beetles from finding the wound and potentially bringing a spore to it. That's the only purpose. Yes, sir. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. And my point is, sometimes on your trees you've got shoots coming out, mm -hmm. you know, and you're going, and so if you trim a whole bunch of little tiny shoots on the same area, isn't that the same as one big one? Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Okay. They, we actually, again, this is all based on research. And uh, back in, in the earlier days of the program, we were trying to figure out how big a wound do you need. And so they'd pluck a leaf, inoculate it with oak wilt spores break the, the, the first twig all the way down the tree, okay? And that's where they came up with the wound's got to be pretty decent size just for the fungus to even get into the tree, okay? So it's not, but I'm, I'm, but I'm kind of thinking the way you're thinking. If I, I do this all the time. I'll walk out to my oak tree. There'll be a little out sprout out there, and I'll just reach up and grab it and pull it off, and I don't even think twice about it, you know? Um, but if you're talking about one of these that's just got tons of epicormic sprouts, I would probably, it would make me sleep better. I would probably try to make an effort to paint them. It's not always going to get done, but I would make an effort. Okay, so uh, don't prune in the spring and immediately paint your pruning cuts. Oh, the other questions I forgot to answer. I've got one of these extending pole saws, and I can't, I can't reach it to paint it. Really? We have instructions right here on how to build a, a, a pole, what do we call it? A pole paint sprayer. Pretty cheap. If you can't paint it, don't cut it. Uh, one other thing I would, make it, I would recommend is, uh, and y'all are doing a good job, um, wounding, not just pruning, but wounding. So when you're out there with the lawnmower and you got those buttress roots on the, you know, the, maybe you got a little bit of erosion going on and you got those flare roots and you're hitting that repeatedly with the lawnmower, that's a wound. You back your pickup into the tree that's too close to the driveway or the driveway's too close to the tree um, and knock the bark off of it, that's a wound. The UPS tr truck comes down the road and keeps skinning that one limb every time, that's a wound. All right, so we have to, we have to think about all of these things. Uh, I think that's the last question. Oh yeah, and one other thing that I want to, uh, gentlemen, I'm speaking to you specifically. Don't get on a ladder with a chainsaw. <laughs> Women aren't that stupid. We are. We are. Um, please don't. Uh, uh, just please don't. Only bad things can happen. All right. Red oaks. Because red oaks have the potential to form fungal mats, if you have a red oak that you suspected died from oak wilt, destroy that tree. You have to think of infected red oaks as being contagious. Typhoid Mary, all right? The way you destroy that tree is you cut it down and burn it, you cut it down and bury it, you cut it down and chip it. Any of the above. If you can't do any of those things, you can girdle the tree as close to the ground as possible, hit it with a, a woody herbicide. You want to dry that tree out as rapidly as possible. That way it won't form fungal mats. Remember, dead dry trees don't, don't form fungal mats. Okay? Firewood. How many of y'all buy firewood? It's okay. It's it's okay. Everybody's like, oh, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, or make your own. There you go. Yeah, you're making your own. Uh, I mean, some of the other folks. Uh, anyway, 
Where you have to be careful is with green infected red oak firewood. Remember I told you to keep a mental picture of that map? How did we get Oak Wilton, Amarillo, Lubbock, Wichita Falls, Midland, Odessa? It's moving green infected red oak wood. They come down here, you cut down this Spanish oak that's not completely dry and dead, they throw it in the back of the truck, they take it back to Amarillo. Next spring, that log forms a fungal mat. They prune their tree, okay, I guess trees, in Amarillo. And um, don't paint, that's how you get oak wilt, okay? Now live oak, Oak wilt killed live oak wood can absolutely be salvaged for, for uh, firewood. The only thing we ask is you don't move it off site until the wood is dry. It's seasoned, dried, cured, whatever terminology it is you want to use, it's indeed firewood. Once it's firewood, you can take it anywhere you want to. If you want to be extra precautious, you can cover it with clear plastic and bury the edges. Uh, the reason you use clear plastic versus black plastic is if any insects are associated with the wood pile, if you poke a hole in the plastic, they can't find it in the clear plastic. In the black plastic, they see the light and they can get out, okay? That's the reason we do that or recommend that. But basically, just insist on it being good dry season firewood. Simple as that. Yes, sir? So it's not about burning it. About it's not about burning it. Oak wilt is a living organism. You set a living organism on fire, you're going to kill it. Simple as that. It's the firewood. Yeah, it's not the fire, it's the firewood. It cannot be moved in the smoke <coughs> or any of that stuff. I'm trying to hurry. Really, I am trying to hurry. We got another question? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you had a question. Okay. Uh, all right. This is going to sound trite and this is going to sound trivial and this is going to sound the longer I deal with oak wilt the more I come to this plant other trees cedar elms don't get oak wilt big tooth maples don't get oak wilt escarpment cherries don't get oak wilt crepe myrtles don't get oak wilt all right the reason oak wilt is so devastating in Central Texas is because all we have are stinking oaks. Well, we also have red oaks. They sound incorrect then. They seem to be the attraction to this they're just the, no, Well, they're just the ones that can make the fungal mats. But oak wilt is still moving, moving through the roots. I mean, once it gets in the live oaks, it's going to move through. I'm just saying create more diversity. I understand the diversity. Okay. No, no, no. Okay, I know where you're going. I know exactly where you're going. Yeah. Well, let's just kill all the red oaks. No. Because we already have hundreds or thousands of established live oak centers. And there's thousands. Every tree can get a disease. Okay, so we're going to take all the trees off? Okay. Well, then the issue is let's not give the let's not give the red oak the disease to begin with. That's where our preventative measures. Right. But again, those beetles are motile. They can fly. All right. So it's not, you know, that's like, how many of you suffer from cedar fever? Okay. It's the male cedar trees. So we're going to go out and cut every single male cedar tree down? Yeah, let's do it. Yes. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. I wish we could, but the problem is, is females will turn into males. Yeah. <laughs> they do. No, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. They will actually do that. So anyway, it's, it's just a matter of the preventative measures. Uh, the females are the ones that get the blueberries on them, and the males are the ones that turn gold and make all the pollen. Okay, how many of y'all are not from Texas originally? Okay, it's real simple. The top of Texas, it's cold. The very tip of Texas, it's hot. East Texas, it's wet. West Texas, it's dry. And we're right in the middle. Okay, the whole purpose of that is that we're in the center of the state. And so we can, we're on the northern edge of the southern forest, we're on the western edge of the eastern forest, we're on the, on the northern edge, of, I already said that, the eastern edge of the western forest, I mean, we're right smack dab in the middle. And what happens is we tend to try things that are a little bit out of range. 
And uh, how many of y'all had Sago Palms freeze this past winter when it got down to 18 that one morning? All right. How many of you, when it was really, really raining, how many of you lost your, or started having a few issues with maybe your uh, desert willows or your mountain laurels? A little too wet for them, and then uh, maybe not. Okay. Try to stick with things that are within range. They've got to be able to tolerate the extremes. Not the averages, but the extremes. Okay? Uh, preferably uh, not invasive nor detrimental to the local environment, and preferably, I prefer natives over exotic trees. If it's Chinese anything, please don't plant it. <laughs> if it's Japanese anything, European anything, um, and then preferably multifunctional. Um, prime example is a Mexican plum. Springtime, they have the flowers. Summertime, we get the fruit. Fall, they get the cool, the nice color. And in the wintertime, they have this cool bark. That's, and so it's a tree for all seasons. Anyway, okay. Uh, don't plant monica. Don't fall in love with one tree. The reason we have Dutch elm disease was because they exclusively planted elm trees along the road. The reason we had chestnut blight was they harvested all of the oak out of the Appalachians for the war effort and only left the chestnuts. Boom. The reason we have oak wilt, all we have are, are basically oak trees around here. We're never going to learn. We're never going to learn. Create diversity and avoid wounding trees, uh, oak trees during planting. Um, if you go to the website, there, there, and you have to look around a little bit, but there's instructions on how to properly plant a tree. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of this. We don't have the time. Uh, and there's some pretty pictures and recommendations. On the website, if you go to resources, the first thing that opens up, there's a little map. It's got all the 10 eco-regions of Texas. Just click on Central Texas. It'll generate a, a tree list for you, 30 trees. It's real simple. Okay, uh, we also sell trees. I'm not going to get into that. Don't worry about this. Okay, let's talk a little bit about trenching. We have done trenching out here to, further, to stop further spreading of the disease. The disease moves through interconnected roots. Theoretically, you get out ahead of the progression of the disease, cut all the roots, you stop it in its tracks, kind of like a fire. You've got a fire burning, you get out ahead of the fire, take the fuel away, burns up to the line and stops. Um, so far, we've been successful with the trenching out here. So far. A um, couple of rules. You have to place it a minimum distance of 100 feet beyond the last symptomatic tree and deep enough to get all the roots cut. Those are the two simple rules. Right Sir? Right through the street. Right through the street. That's where we went out here. That's where we went out here. Y'all actually got off easy. They did some trenching out in Westlake Hills and some other neighborhoods in and around Austin that were, it was upwards of $60 a foot. So y'all actually got off kind of light. I'm not saying it was pleasant. I'm just saying it was a little bit better. All right, so the rules to trenching, you, again, nah, I don't need to go into all of that. Depth should not be based on minimum requirements. Our minimum requirements are 48 inches deep. The site should dictate what type of equipment you use and how deep you need to go, okay? Uh, the big rock saw in the lower left-hand corner, that thing will go 60 inches deep. That was the one that was run out here? 54. Oh, you brought the other guy. Okay. One of the saws will go 60, one will go 54. Uh, in a rural setting, out in the pasture, out in the middle of nowhere, it's about $3.50 a linear foot. Okay. How much is that can of paint? Uh, we used to do a lot of trenching with the bulldozer, pulling that ripper tooth. In the very top hole on that tooth, he was going six foot deep. But people really don't like you pulling bulldozers next to their houses and pulling up all the rocks and everything. It kind of leaves a mess. On deeper sites, we'll use backhoes and excavators. So it's, again, site dictates what type of equipment you use. Um, out in the country, out in rural settings, we highly recommend that you push over all of the trees on the inside of the trench, even though, even though there's a buffer of non-symptomatic trees, most of those trees are going to get the disease and die anyway, so we figure put the trench in to sever the root system and then push over everything on the inside of it. You kill the top, you, fer you kill the root system faster, you kill the fungus faster. Not a lot of people want to do this. 
Uh, yada, 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 we're not going to worry about all that. Okay, fungicide injections. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on this. Some of your neighbors can tell you anything and everything you need to know about injections. Um, fungicide injections are effective. They do work. They do work in keeping particular trees alive. But the protocols you have to follow. You have to treat the right tree at the right time using the right product and, in, and just getting it distributed throughout the tree properly. There's a lot of ifs. You, you, you. In this particular example, you see the big tree, the, the healthy tree in the, in the front yard between the two pickups? That is a prime candidate for injection. If you wait until the tree begins showing symptoms like the ones to the right, that's too late. Your chances of success go and the thing is, is 100% successful treatment on those trees on the right, that's as good as those trees will ever look. It's the one, it's the, anything that's within 50 to 100 feet of active oak wilt with no barrier in between, those are the candidates for the fungicide injections. All right? They're going to contract the disease within the next year or two. Again, you have to have the fungicide in the right place in the tree at the right time. For those of you that live plumb on the other end of Garden Ridge, away from where the oak wilt centers are, don't panic. You don't have to treat your trees right now. There's no immediate threat. All right? You can treat trees way too soon. You can treat them too late. The other, thing, the other point I want to make is treating trees with the, or injecting trees with the fungicide does not stop the disease from moving through the root system. Because when we inject the tree, most of the fungicide goes up. Not enough of it goes down into the root system to make a barrier. So the disease will just pass, pass that tree and go on to the next one. All right. This injection is uh, about $15 a diameter inch. So a 10-inch tree is going to run you anywhere about 150 bucks. That's not a very big tree. Again, how much is that can of paint? All right. Uh, success depends on the health of the tree. That means is it infected or not, injection technique, and all of these things. Uh, it's a big process. You expose the flare root, you hook this big harness up to it. It's a multi-port IV is what it is. That's, that's the best way to look at this. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go. There are alternatives out there, some legit, some not so legit. The only thing I can recommend is the macro infusion technique using Alamo because we know through research that works. All of this other stuff, I don't know if it works or not. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm not saying it does work. I just saying I can't point to peer reviewed journals or papers that say that it does one way or the other. So in other words, if you want to go micro injection with Tebujet, or if you want to use the chem jets, or if you want to use a, an alternative, a different product, buyer beware. I can't give you a realistic expectation of results. Macro infusion with Alamo, if you treat the right tree at the right time and it's not yet showing symptoms, you've got an 80 to 90% chance of saving that tree. I can't say that with all these other products. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. because you, you know, you that is correct. Trees, that is correct. Yeah, you don't know where. Most times you can tell. If you've got somebody that really knows how to look at the tree and, 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 and has been involved with the project from, from beginning to end, even a 100% successful macro injection, you're going to have a little bit of canopy loss because you just can't get fungicide in every single one of those water conducting vessels. So you're going to have a little bit of dieback. It may not be obvious to you or, or somebody else, but to the trained eye, guy, I, I know vendors that can come out and go, yeah, yeah, we treated, I was out here two years ago, I treated these trees and the disease is right here. There, there's guys out there that can do that. There's also guys out there that just go by a date on the calendar because they know they're going to get a paycheck from you. I'm just saying. Buyer beware. Basically, it's got to be reliable, research, verified by research results, not propaganda from the chemical company. Uh, increased survival over the natural population. Natural population survival rate is 15 to 
that ain't much. My expectations, if I'm going to hire somebody to come out and treat a tree and they're going to charge me a couple of 300 bucks, my expectations are going to be a little higher than 25%. I want to be up around 80, 90%. Uh, safe, economical, reasonably easy to apply, and legal. There's a lot of things out there. You're going to do a Google search. I know you are. That's what we do. And you're going to see things, and you're going to give me a call, and I'm going to go, no, don't do that. It's illegal. Or no, don't, it's not on the label. No, it's not this. You're going to see a whole bunch of products out there, and if you can kind of wade through, again, the propaganda. What was one of the first statements I told you all? Primary vascular pathogen. Okay, if this fungus lives inside the tree, do you think a foliar spray is going to do any good? No. If this fungus is a primary pathogen, do you think putting down a slurry of mycorrhiza fungi and nutrient and that kind of stuff is going to work? I'm trying to be very, very careful and not pinpoint certain companies. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to be very, very careful here. Um, do your research. Check multiple sources. Uh, do those kinds of things because, unfortunately, there are still folks out there that are trying to take advantage of Oakwell. That's all I'm going to say. All right. We've done a lot of trenching. Over 4 million feet. That's Houston to Lubbock since 1988. We've actually done a little more than that. We're batting about 74% success rate. Who's on a plane to Vegas with me with 74% odds? <laughs> In a heartbeat, right? Okay. It's not 100%. 26% of the time it doesn't work. But most of the time it does. Three out of four, I'll take those odds any day. Any day. Uh, that's just my region in red. That's where all of our forest serve, our, our offices are. There's seven of us that deal with Oakwell. Yes, sir? Mm. The, the difference between the distributed cost and the total cost? Uh, we have a cost share program in which we can pay part of the trenching cost if it qualifies. Um, all three of the centers out here in Garden Ridge qualified, correct? That's right. We didn't have the money that year. Yeah, That's what it, we ran out of money that year. It qualified, but it was already spent. We qualified for two of them. One of them, unfortunately, fell in that, in that time period when we didn't have the funds. Apologize. Well, two out of three. Uh, 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 but basically what is, we have a cost share program. And, um, oh, you asked the question. The, uh, the cost shares is, is what the federal government gave us for, to distribute to landowners for trenching. And then the total cost was the total cost of the whole of the project. The whole project. So, in other words, we have limits on our cost shares. It's forty percent up to a thousand dollars. So, even so, if you spend five thousand bucks, you're only going to get a thousand from us. Okay. Sure. So that's where the cost. That's that's where the differences are. Uh, again, there's that. Uh, you got the brochure. The website is printed on the brochure. Again, get your cameras out. These are fantastic resources. It's also on the TexasOakWilt.org website if you want to look at some of these things. We have links to pretty much all of this. Uh, we even have, we don't have this presentation, but we have a, a very easy to follow. These two things are, are, are the Oak Wilt presentation that's on the website. Uh, we have a quick guide, do's and don'ts, how to identify, all of that kind of thing. Here's a timeline on the back, what you should be doing when, what you should not be doing when, okay? Um, Steve's getting pretty good at identifying oak wilt, or at least looking at trees. Um, anyway, there's all of that. All right, and again, I'm going to be serious about this. Oak wilt is not an individual, especially when you're in a suburban or urban environment. It's that's not just each property owner that it affects. It affects the entire community, or potentially can. And the actions that we do on our own properties can affect all of our neighbors, all right? And so basically, with oak wilt, it's, it's pretty simple. Don't prune your oak trees in the spring. If you see your neighbor doing it, maybe yell at him over the fence. Hey, man, uh, well, you might not be wanting to do that right now. Paint your pruning cuts. 
and be careful about moving around firewood. It's pretty simple. You do those three things, I'm not saying we will absolutely 100% prevent any new oak wilt centers from starting in Garden Ridge. Mother Nature has a way of starting things on her own. But we do it to ourselves. Most new oak wilt centers we, we, we cause ourselves through our actions. And so if just let's all kind of try to work together <laughs> and get on the same page. And I'm not saying we're all need to, you know, buy the world a Coke or anything like that. But it's, let's, this can be prevented. So how many centers do we have here in Garden Ridge? And Three. When was the last one discovered? Last one was two years ago? Yeah, it was the park. Yeah, a couple of years ago. And as far as around the immediate area, if you go up 30-09, uh, um, Natural Bridge Caverns area, there's some pretty good-sized oak wilt centers. Or what is it? Pierce Massey, I think, is the name of the road. If you go up it, there's oak wilt back up in there. Uh, that's actually on the Weiss property. It's actually on the Caverns property. There's a couple of spots in New Braunfels. I'm not going to tell you where because they swore me to secrecy. Um, I actually found a, a new Oak Wilt Center in Fisher this year, this spring. And so north of Canyon Lake, I'm, I'd never found any Oak Wilt before, but I found one in Fisher. South of Canyon Lake, uh, what's the big uh, Cranes Mill that sticks out? We found an oak, there's an Oak Wilt Center there. The western end of the county, over where I live, down in the Bull Verde area, uh, Basically, Bull, uh, Blanco Road and, and 46, there's a property there. It's got a big oak wilt center. And then if you go all the way to Bergheim and heading down toward Fair Oaks Ranch, there's a subdivision down there called Silver Hill, Silver Wing, something. Huge, nasty oak wilt center down there. That's there, was, there was one in Schoenthal Ranch. Several Forgot about that one. Thank you. That one's been trenched. Trench. Yeah, we trenched and contained that one. Yeah, I, I, I totally forgot about that one. Um, so there's a handful. There's a handful around. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, you're, you come down and you, we're kind of the southern edge of your territory, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, and there's a, your counterpart. Which one? Uh, for Bear County, kind of. For Bear County, that's going to be the Kerrville office. Jones okay. Walker or somewhere. Right. You know, and, uh, They're not there anymore. Oh, really? Okay. Well, he retired. Okay. And our new forester that we hired... That, that office was originally in Kerrville, okay. and, but because he lived in San Antonio, we moved it to San Antonio. Okay. We've moved it, now moved it back to Kerrville. Okay. Um, Hollywood Park. Yes. Park. Yes. I talked to the folks at Hollywood yes. Park, and they're, they put in 200, I don't know, you know, thousands of dollars into Yep. And theirs was not successful because they had cars or something, uh, holes. Holes in the rock, and they couldn't get down and get all of the roots cut. Yeah, that happens. Like I said, I, I, there are places I go. We go out, and you don't know until you trench and and see if it. The alternative, if you don't do anything, it's going to spread, and you're going to lose most of your trees. Uh, the other alternative is you get on a treatment program, an injection program, and start treat. But you're, then you're going to be doing that from now on. Like I said, it's 26 percent doesn't work. 74% does. I have areas, I have certain places where we put trenches in and I don't know, it just doesn't work. And I have other areas where it's just... Well, the question that I was There is. There's a little bit. Again, I, that's not in my region, um, but there are, there are other Oak Wilt centers in Bear County other than just Hollywood Park, especially the northwest side of Holotus area back toward Bandera County back in there. Yeah, you're gonna, you, there's Oak Wilt out there. Um, it just kind of depends on where you are. So like the one you said out in East Ranch, you said that was just like growing. They tried way back in the day to uh, do some trenching, and they weren't successful. Um, the, the neighborhood, are they, we talking about on Pierce Massey Road, or are we talking about the Weast Ranch? I haven't heard from those guys. Um, I don't know. I haven't been on there, over there in several years, so I, I couldn't tell you what's going on over there. They never called me back, which is generally a good sign. 
If we put a trench in and I never get a return phone call or never hear from them, you know, three or four years down the road, that generally means that the trench is still holding. Not always, but sometimes. So these connecting routes go under the roads? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, these routes will go. The only thing I would consider a permanent or a barrier to route movement would be uh, permanent water. Um, no host goes out into a coastal field or something like that. There's no oak trees out there. Um, an obvious land feature, you know, a 50-foot bluff, cliff, something like that. Um, but a road, no. Matter of fact, I mean, unless it was something like I-10 or 35 down, down here, something like that. But just a, just a regular subdivision road or even just a state highway, no. One of our centers here, I believe the fellow treated it, did a treatment mm -hmm. on this tree. How did that turn out for you? Don't know. There are several people that treated the trees. There's one gentleman sitting right back here. <laughs> this is over by the lake. That dead end, Glen, Cove. Glen Cove. Yeah. Well, well there, there were several. There were several landowners that treated their trees yeah. through there. Did they do any trenching over there? Yes. Yeah. Both. Big time. Big time. Uh, right back here. Give you the whole story. <laughs> Talk to him. <laughs> Jerry, right there. Jerry, yeah. Basically, you know, there's a couple things happening here. One, we have people coming into our neighborhoods to cut trees. Correct. Well, do you have an ordinance? We do. Do you, you have an ordinance? And who enforces the ordinance? You have to follow up, and you can't just be a neighbor to say, please don't do that. They're going to do what they darn well please and not paint. And there's a community that you know, statewide, you might be. I've heard the community talk about four or five times, so they usually leave. There will never be a... What, you're talking about statewide? We can't even get state funding That's for the program. Answer. Talk to your legislatures, that kind of thing. I, I mentioned it to Biederman when we first had this problem. Mm -hmm. We had no idea there was a problem. Yeah. But and the, the, well, there you go. There you go. The, the, the thing is... So how else can we be effective to help or assist? Well, I mean, it, again, there are a variety of different ordinances, and there's different ways of enforcing things. You're going to have to do it on the community level. You can't even do it on the county level. All right? Um... I know there's, there are, order, if you go onto the website, go to, um, what do we call it, community tools, whatever the last uh, tab is, and then we have um, various ordinances, different cities that have Oakwilt related ordinances. They're all, and whoever wants to list it, as a matter of fact, I don't know if y'all put y'all's on the website. So it's up there. Um, there was one ordinance. They basically, what they did was anybody that came in to the subdivision had to stop by the office first. And if they were going to do anything that could potentially damage a tree, they had to buy a, perm a refundable permit. And then they had to read like, a, like the quick guide, you know, the quick little thing. And then on, upon exit, somebody had to go inspect the work. And if they did everything properly, they got their, their permit feedback. So there's various ways of doing things. Well, these trees affect the value of our property. Absolutely they do. It's affect the cities. Absolutely it does. It seems like the state, all those kind of bills, and it seems like you would have, yeah. have some teeth to do something. Again. 96% privately owned. That's a big deal. We can't even get TxDOT to do things correctly. Okay. So, yeah, good luck with everybody else. I don't mean that in a, in a, in a negative or bad way. I'm just saying it's, it's, it would, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it would be an extremely huge effort. So, can I say something? Yes, let, please. Here. Well, I, I just want to talk about all of us are conditioned that we, we don't want to dime out our neighbors. We don't want to, oh, look at my neighbor's. 
you know, build a shed or this, that, or the other thing. But if we can all consider what Mr. Edmondson said about how much it affects all of us if somebody's cutting and they're not, they're not painting or they're cutting the wrong time. And I'll tell you that by far, the people that we catch correct uh, with the behavior are when someone else has told us. So, you know, uh, public works is always looking. Police are always looking. Our water guys are looking. But there's only so many of them. So if, and spread the word, because there's not that many of us in here, but if you see something, call us, and we'll get somebody out there. And I can tell you just in the past month, we've chased after quite a few people. Uh, and uh, in fact, I, in my own neighborhood, some, they were trimming in our common area, and I stopped and I said, hey, what's going on? And, I, and, uh, and, uh, and found out that they were clueless about it. So now the flip side of that is, you know, making, making them all have some kind of oak wilt cutting license, something or other, is not tenable. It's just not. Um, you know, we require people to have, uh, to have a, 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 a permit to be able to solicit but we don't require people to have a permit to do business for you. So if you hire them, they didn't, they, you know, they're not running around the neighborhood soliciting, but your neighbor had them, and so you hire them. We, we, we don't get in the way of that. And, and I'll tell you that most people that live in Texas and live in Garden Ridge don't want that. They don't want us to tell them who they can hire and who they can't hire in their own home and yard. And uh, so that's, that, but, but again, please spread the word that if you see, you know, you see somebody cutting, whether it's a, a, a homeowner or a company, and, you're, and you don't see any painting going on, or you see them cutting the wrong time of year, give us a holler, and we're going to go out there right away. Uh, and we will go out there, and we do go out there right away. Yes, sir. So the comment for somebody watching a video uh, talked about how it needs to be continual education and continual awareness, and hence Mr. Edmondson here. Uh, this is a this is a repeat, you know, a repeat command performance. But uh, also, you, you notice that whenever we get to the point where we're coming down to the wire on on oak well trimming season, you start to see it out there. This is the last because I, I, I do the sign. So the last week the last weekend, the last days, today is the last day to try to really raise that awareness uh, and putting in, again, in, in you know, the other media we have. On the website, you can go there. There's a whole section on oak wilt. It has pictures of you know, what, a, what a leaf might look like. Uh, and you can come here. I don't know if you know, but you can send people up here. And we have a bag of leaves, that, uh, and they can look and say, oh, this is what uh, an oak wilt leaf looks like. Again, that's not 100%. You heard all that. But at least it's a start, and it raises the awareness. And you're right, you know, coming and going of, of residents and then people that have forgotten. And frankly, I, I, I'm glad I came because there's some things. I've heard him speak before. And I go, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Or, oh, I want to be able to make sure people know about that. So that's that's big reason why I asked him if he minded if we, we recorded this, because I really want to talk up, hey, okay, you can come here tonight, will you get online and watch this? Because you're, Jerry, you're absolutely right. Awareness of this is really a big deal. Let me, so let me hand it over back. Okay. You're done? You're done? I'm done. Unless All right. There are other questions? Well, um, I, is, is, here. Look, here. Go ahead. Oh, oh both those. Assuming a tree has been properly trenched and then injected, It's hard to say. Uh, it, it really is hard to say. Um, trenching and efficacy, it depends on, on if the disease spreads, if there's barrier to spread, that kind of thing. Um, I like to see the disease up to the trench line somewhere between two and four years after the trench was installed. That's kind of the sweet spot. Um, if it's right at the trench line a year later, I get nervous. I think 
we might have got too close. You know, and if it's several years before and the disease hadn't even got to the trench line yet, I get nervous there too because you could have roots growing back across the trench. Uh, as far as the injections go, um, you'll know probably 18 to 24 months after initial injection. Sometimes, fat, sometimes sooner, sometimes later, but somewhere in that 18 to 24 month period. Sorry. <laughs> and and actually, public works can do that. We'll 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 do we'll do that. Yeah, absolutely. And what if you didn't hear? She said uh, um, maybe we can hand these materials out at National Night Out. Uh, very absolutely. Any other questions? All of these materials came from the website. TexasOakWilt.org, the community tools, and, and it, it's all on the website. Really, just make. Yeah. No, I understand. I, yeah, I understand. But, you know, some of the, the millennials, just give them the website. Gen Xers and, and baby boomers, we want paper. <laughs> okay. All right. Any, any other questions? That was the point I was making about, you know, you don't, don't panic and start treating trees, okay? Because if it's a half a mile away from you, that's 5,200 feet, that's 2,600 feet, uh, 50 feet a year, that's 52 years. Okay? <laughs> yes? Correct. Correct. That is correct. And then there's lots and lots of infrastructure in an urban environment. So you may not have just perfect root connections and things. So there, there, there's, a, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. Anyone else? All right. Well, Robert, thank you so much for being a partner with us on this. We appreciate it. Yes, sir.